Good morning, friends. Steve from Southern Illinois again here. Beautiful spring down here still. A little rain, a little sunshine, but my front yard is just a wash with daffodils. When we moved here, hmm, well nigh 30 years ago, there were a few daffodils scattered out through the woods in the back. But as time has gone on, I've uh, dug them up as they've multiplied and spread them to different parts of the yards. And uh, yeah, spring we have thousands of daffodils. Vivian picks bouquets to take to friends. Driving uh, down to El Dorado this week, the maple trees were putting a wash of red and green across the tips of the, the forests. It's a beautiful time of year. In the days before GPS satellites and cell phones, a person traveling in unfamiliar territory oriented themselves by looking at the sky. East and west were defined by where the sun came up, where the sun went down. North was defined by the one star that didn't rotate during the night, Polaris, the North Star, for those of us here in the, the uh, Northern Hemisphere. With these three points, where the sun came up, the sun came down, and the North Star, you could orient yourself and have a sense of direction. You might not know where you were, your location, <laughs> and you those three points certainly didn't define your destination, but at least you had a sense of what direction you were traveling. These last three devotionals, I've shared my spiritual equivalent of sunrise, sunset, and the North Star. These experiences are the equivalent of celestial landmarks in my life. They shaped my worldview. They provide me with a sense of direction. You know, as a boy, my brother and I took a class on orientation in our local church's youth group. And we learned how to use a compass and read a topographical map and all of the other tricks of the trade. The goal of the course was to teach us how to navigate through wilderness where there were no roads. Now, my classmates just laughed. We were in Kansas, okay? There was a road every place. Yeah, there were big fields, but there were always roads. You just follow the road. Who needs a compass? Why do you need to know what, who, where north and south are? My brother and I? We had just moved there from rural New Mexico where roads were few and far between. And we had learned firsthand what it was like to get lost just a few miles from home. So as we were taking the course, we saw this as important information because our experience made it feel important. Almost all of our lives take a turn at some point where some, some where, uh, you know, boom, the road is gone. We're in unexpected territory. We, the givens that we thought we could depend on have disappeared. Relationships, situations, jobs. We make mistakes that we thought we were too smart make and life falls apart and we don't know how to put it back together again. That's when we need landmarks to orient ourselves so we, that we have and provide a sense of direction. So today I want to share the first of two stories that took me from having that sense of direction that I got from my three landmark stories and gave me a sense of destination.
neither of these stories stand on their own. But if I cram them all together into one session, well, we'd be here a while. So, to really understand one, you have to listen to the other. Story the first. I was sitting in church one Sunday. You heard me right. I was sitting in church one Sunday. Now, I call these Sabbath devotionals. I share them with you on Saturday. Those of you who know me know that I'm a Sabbath keeper. What was I doing in church on Sunday? <laughs> What's more, I was sitting in the choir on Sunday. Why? Because I was having a difficult time determining what my destination was. Last week I quoted a Bible scholar who said that Christianity is Christianity begins not with solving intellectual difficulties, but with satisfying the longing of the heart. Well, I haven't discovered that yet. I was tied up in pretzels, pretzels trying to solve the intellectual difficulties. And like many Christians, I was on the verge of giving up. Not giving up on Christianity. Uh, I enjoyed the relationships. I enjoyed the experience. And so that had become the reason I went to church. I went to church. I chose my church based on who went there or the experience that I had going there. I didn't choose it based on truth or a sense of rightness. I was on the verge of giving up. Unlike my neighbor whose chainsaw is going to be doing competition with us, okay? Um, so there I was sitting in the choir on a Sunday morning, okay, and uh, I was trying to stay awake, you see, because with all of my difficulties with the intellectual questions, I was having, um, you know, I had not listened to a sermon for years. I'd been in church, but I'd not listened to a sermon for years because I had found that listening to a sermon was a very frustrating experience because I would get into these arguments with the preacher about what he was saying inside my head, but he never listened to what was going on inside my head. He just kept rambling on and on and on, completely off topic if you ask me, because these questions needed to be addressed. And so listening to a sermon was uh, absolutely frustrating to me, and I'd, I'd get all tied up in knots inside and angry, and it was just easier to just zone out pretend I wasn't there and think about something else. The problem was <sighs> I would often fall asleep. Yep, I'd often fall asleep in church. That's not polite to do when you're sitting in the choir at the front of the church. And so I was struggling very hard to stay awake without listening to the sermon. And that's when it happened. Okay, this fly buzzed past my head. And the preacher was in front of us, a little bit lower, and on the top of his head was this beautifully defined, round landing field, which the fly immediately gravitated towards, landed on that bald pate. Ah. Now the pastor noticed the fly, and um, without breaking stride at all, just worked in a stroke over his head into his gestures during his preaching, and the fly took off and easily evaded his clumsy efforts. Okay, and it buzzed around a little bit and then came back in and landed, and the pastor worked another wave of his arms in, and the fly took off and back in. And I'm, I'm, I'm watching this happening, okay, and 
inside myself, sitting in the choir, I'm starting to laugh at the, the comedy that's going on in front of me, and the pastor d trying to get the fly to go away without letting anybody in the congregation know what's going on. And as I'm laughing there, I let my guard down. And for the first time in years, all of a sudden I heard what the preacher was saying. He was talking about how God covers his people with his hand to protect them from the evil in this world because he loves them so much, because he treasures them, because he cares about them. Immediately, the skeptic in me leaped up and said, Oh, yeah, that's one of those platitudes that Christians tell themselves. God's covering us with his hand. But you can't tell me that bad things don't happen to good people. Even good Christians. They get sick. They get cancer. They get in car wrecks. They get divorced. They're drug addicts. They, they're just like the rest of us, and they experience life like the rest of us. They just want to hide behind this, God's covering me with his hand. And as I was thinking those thoughts, another thought came into my mind. But what about me? Nothing bad has ever happened in my life. Nobody close to me has died. Every dream that I've had, it's like the doors were just opening in front of me. Like somebody was preparing the way, and... Whoa. If there is a God, and if he cares about me, could he be covering me with his hand and protecting me and... And how have I responded to him? And all of a sudden I had this crushing sense of how disrespectful and cruel my ingratitude was to this hypothetical being this father who loved me. Now, you may say it's hypothetical, but is that the kind of person I want to be? And right there in the choir, in church on Sunday morning, I prayed a prayer. I said, God, your mercy and your grace has not brought me to repentance. I don't know what to do. So I'm just going to ask you, do whatever it takes to save me. And immediately this voice said in my right ear, Done! And this chill went down my spine, and the loud voice was so loud and authoritative that I jerked my head to see who was talking. And the women sitting behind me in choir were like, What? What? What's the matter? Are you okay? And I, and I just felt my fa face go absolutely pale. And I felt sick to the to pit of my stomach. And I, I, I kind of shamefacedly just, you know, shook my head and turned around. But I couldn't escape this sense of doom. What was going to happen? What had I done? I'd asked God to do whatever he had to do. And he'd responded. And I'm just going to let the question hang there. How have you responded to God in your life? Now, I'm not saying your life has been perfect. My life hasn't been perfect. But if what the Bible says is true, that there is a God who cares about us, who does everything he can 
to guide us in paths of safety, to protect us from the evil that is everywhere in this world? How have we responded to him? That question changed the direction of my life. So, I'm going to stop here. Next week, I'll tell you the rest of the story. Be safe, my friends. Be prudent. But above all, keep looking up. And thank you for joining me.